and Savior Jesus Christ. Our worship today is divine service setting four. It begins this morning in the front of your hymn on page 203, immediately after the scene of our opening hymn, number 399. <laughs>
governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the receiving of God's holy word. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after the Epiphany is from Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, Seeing you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in, a cleft, in the cleft of a rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church's body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise to honor our God in the hearing of his gospel. Yet come. 
His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess again our preacher faith this morning in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of life, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Who for us and then for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the singing of our servant again.
text of this morning's message comes from our gospel lesson. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. These are the words of God that we will meditate upon this morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We are in the epiphany season of the church year right now. I know that because the pyramids are green. Alex, I forgot to change this morning, but I know it's a bit different. But every season of the church year that we have is very focused. And it has a purpose. And that purpose is always to bring us into a closer relationship, a better understanding of who our Lord Jesus is. What is ministry? Is, what his message is, and that our salvation is in him. As we learned in Bible study today, Jesus is God's plan of salvation. And like most years, the epiphany season, I see, is kind of like coming into a movie ten minutes late. After it's started. We press kind of dropped in to the story. As you know, Epiphany, the actual day of Epiphany this year was on a Thursday, a week ago, last Thursday. So even last Sunday, which was the first Sunday after the Epiphany, we kind of came into Epiphany three days late. We missed the whole beginning of Epiphany, that coming of the Magi to the young Jesus, sitting down with him, before him, worshiping him. And we kind of started last week right away with the baptism of Jesus. We kind of missed like 30 years. But you know, that's okay. Because no matter where it is, we drop down into epiphany. The message, the meaning, and the desired result of this blessed season are the same. The epiphany season. It's all about miracles, manifestations, but mostly, and most importantly, it's about faith. Faith in Jesus Christ as the revealed Messiah. And so the church through her ancient and regular pericopes, those Bible lessons that we have every Sunday morning, they, the church walks us through this time of year, this celebration that we have after the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ to, to better understand exactly who he is and why he came. We are even given glimpses of his glory to bridge us over in this gap period that we seem to find ourselves in now between Christmas and Lent, yes, Lent, which is coming up very quickly in just a few weeks. Jesus gave those glimpses of glory then, and he gives us these glimpses of glory now because we need them. We need them for the exact same reason the disciples back then needed those reasons. Because we are weak in our faith. And because we need the power and the means to believe in Jesus for our salvation. So that we do not lose it and are thereby lost. So what about those epiphany glimpses of glory? We just sang about some of them in the hymn just before the sermon. Yes, we did miss the Magi. The Magi who came there to Jesus, and Jesus himself being the manifestation of God. They followed the manifestation of that miraculous star, and yet the more important thing was that manifestation of God, the child of Jesus. They saw and they believed. And last week, we have the triune God manifesting himself again at the baptism of our Savior. The Father speaks from heaven. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And, of course, Jesus is standing there in the water. And miracle of faith against his 
is multiplied as all of those people saw that. And John, again, had the opportunity to point and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And also in Jesus' baptism, all of our baptisms are sanctified. And we get a glimpse of glory through all of this as the Holy Spirit brings us to faith. We will see many more glimpses of Christ's glory in the weeks that are yet ahead. We're going to see glimpses of his glory in his power over human disease, in his power over all of creation. And Epiphany will wrap up on the mountain of transfiguration where Jesus comes there with his three disciples. And there they stand in the presence of Moses and Elijah. And Jesus reveals his glory. This was something that the disciples were going to need because immediately they were going to go with Jesus down into the valley. They were going to walk in that valley of the shadow of death. They were going to walk with Jesus through those sorrows to Calvary, to the cross. But Jesus gave them that glimpse of glory so that they would have the strength that they needed to do that and they could come out on the other side on Easter. So while... Epiphany is a pretty miraculous season that often gets so overlooked because it's crammed with between Christmas and Lent. We have a miraculous star. We have the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove and the voice of the Father. And we have this glorious transfiguration where Jesus, his, his face shines like the sun and he is clothed in white as light and clothes that are as white as light. The cold being there with him was Moses and Elijah, and he talked with him about his exodus on the cross. Epiphany is so powerful, amazing stuff. And it is again today. In what we hear St. John write about this beautiful miracle at the wedding at Cana that we heard in the gospel, and what does John say about it? He wraps it up by saying, this is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. He manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Belief in him. That is what it's all about. And John puts an exclamation on all of this at the end of his gospel that we sang just a little while ago. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus signs all of the things he did we're always for bringing faith. For bringing the gift of faith in Jesus Christ because that is what saves. These signs, these glimpses of glory, they aren't just for epiphany though. Jesus still gives signs for faith. Now they're not like the signs that so many people ask for or even expect. Maybe a miraculous vision, a miraculous healing, some kind of other thing that they want to see a sign from Jesus so that they will believe. But signs that Jesus gives are not like that. His signs do what signs always do. They point to something. And they keep you on the right path so that you don't get lost. Jesus' church today is full of his signs. Signs that point to faith. Signs that keep us in faith. Signs that keep us on the right path so that we make it home. We have those signs during the Epiphany season, but we have them all year long. Let's begin with baptism. Your baptism isn't just a sign that you've made a decision for Jesus or that you have vowed that you were going to love and obey him. That is 
an incorrect teaching. That is not what Scripture has to say. God says your baptism is a work of His grace. The water doesn't just symbolize the cleansing of your sin. God says that this water, combined with the powerful word and promise of God, does indeed cleanse you from your sin. It makes you God's child. It gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It gives you faith. Baptism is both a sign, but it is also a reality because it is God's working in a very material way for your salvation so that we can see, so that we can comprehend what we never could in our own sin-cursed and fallen reason ever see or comprehend on our own. In Jesus, the sign and the reality are the same in Him. And holy absolution. It is also not just a sign, it is a reality. On the night of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, he said to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. And so we say from the Catechism, I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, in particular, when they absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and just as certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. That is sure and that is confident faith in our forgiveness, in confession and absolution, in Jesus, the sign and the reality are the same. And so it is in the Lord's Supper. The bread and the wine are not merely signs. They are a reality. Because Jesus held out the bread and he said, This, my body. He held forth the wine and he said, This, my blood. Given and shed for you. For the forgiveness of your sins. It isn't just a sign of something that happened a long time ago. It is a present and ongoing reality of the receiving of Jesus' sacrifice for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the strengthening of our faith in Him. In the Lord's Supper, because of Jesus Christ, the sign and the reality are the same in Him. Why do we need all these signs? Because we are so tempted to wander off the path. Like we talked about in Bible study this morning, we are so easily fixated on the problems of this world that we lose our focus on Jesus and we forget what it's all about. So God keeps giving us these signs. He keeps pointing us back to these signs, to these realities. And we need that because you and I are sinners. Indeed. We were conceived that way. We are born that way, we live that way, and we will die that way without Jesus. So he came. He came to be our Savior and to give us more than just signs. He came to give us the reality of his saving work. He died for our sins. And yet he also rose again from the dead to prove to you and I with a unmistakable sign and reality that the entire payment for all the sins of the world is complete in him. And he has given therefore to his church these signs which are realities of his saving work. The signs that we still receive of his glory through word and sacrament. And the purpose of these signs, which are also a reality, are the same now as they have ever been, so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So every miracle that Jesus continues to perform in his church today is there to bring people to faith in Him. 
as their Savior. The miracle of baptism brings someone who is spiritually dead back to life, cleanses them of all their sins, gives them the Holy Spirit and makes them a child of God, gives them saving faith in their Savior, Jesus Christ. The miracle of the Lord's Supper brings to us the very body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And we have our sins forgiven and our faith is strengthened. In holy absolution, every time we confess our sins before God, we don't hear, you're right, you are awful sinners. Now go and straighten up. No, immediately you hear what God has commanded his church through his ministers to do, to proclaim to you God's grace, to proclaim to you that you are forgiven time and time and time again. Like 120 gallons of fine wine, Jesus continues to richly supply us with faith and forgiveness in these signs, which are reality. Remember that the signs, the purpose and the result of signs, the sign of Cana, it's all about faith. Because faith is the ultimate miracle. Christ comes to give us faith, to make faith more firm in his followers. He comes to give faith to build up faith, to instruct us in the faith, to confirm us in the faith, to hold us in the faith until the day we see him face to face. In the meantime, let's open our eyes. Let's see Jesus as he chooses to come to us. In the means that he has given to us. In the abundance that he lavishes upon us in these means of unending forgiveness. Fifteen glory is soon passing. It's going to be replaced in the church year with repentant and a humble walk into Lent. But God gives us both the glory and the poor. He gives us all of these signs that are realities, all of these miracles for one purpose, to point us to Jesus so that we can receive from him faith Faith in Him as our Savior and receive Jesus and all the forgiveness He has for us in the way that He has chosen to come to us. So my friends, I beg you, see the signs. Know that they are more than signs, they are reality. And receive faith. Receive salvation. And trust. Trust in Christ's unlimited, rich, abundant, miraculous love for you. And the joy we can say to that. Amen. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time I ask that you register your attendance in God's house this morning on the paths at the end of your pew. As our prayers are brought forward and as the offerings are collected. Along with prayers listed in your bulletin for today, we will be praying for Al or for Martha upon the loss of her dear husband Al, and we will also pray for Julie and her recovery. Let us rise now as we lift our prayers and praises to God our Father. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, you manifested your glory in the sign of Cana. As you restored creation through the shedding of Christ's blood, pour out your grace in abundance. Give us joy and gladness in the revelation of your truth in the person of your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord of glory, preserve your Son's bride, the church. Make it her constant joy and delight to preach the good news of forgiveness and her Savior to poor sinners. To that end, bless the work among, that work among us by our pastors, John Jenkins and Carl Beckwith, and around the world through our missionaries, the Lawson and Federwitz families. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord of glory, you rule this world by your power. 
Give us your, give to our civil servants respect and recognition of your creation and its nature. When they use the authority given them from above, let it be in accord with your good design for our world and not according to the design of the corruption of sin, which they are to rebuke for the good of their citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of glory, we bring before you the, dis the sick, the distressed, and the needy. Today, especially, do we pray for Pam and Cindy, for Terry and Marcia, for Lori and Robert, for Lauren and Steve and Charlie and Kay, for our homebound Linda and Francis, for Julie's quick recovery, and for comfort and peace for our sister Martha, and for all of those others that we lift up now before you in our hearts. Give your abiding comfort in every circumstance that in Christ we shall not die, but live and declare his works. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord of glory, as you manifested yourself by the sign of Cana, transforming water into wine, so manifest yourself to us here, transforming bread and wine to be your very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and make us fit partakers in repentance and faith. Lord, in your mercy. In our Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that, for, that of your grace you have instituted holy matrimony in which you keep us from unchastity and other offenses. We implore you, send your blessing on every husband and wife. Do not let them provoke one another to anger and strife, but let them live peaceably together in love and godliness. Strengthen them with your gracious help in all temptations. Help them to rear their children in accordance with your will. Grant all to walk before you in purity and holiness, putting our trust in you and leading such lives on earth that in the world to come we may have everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament of God beginning on page 200. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him, being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, For you have had mercy on us, and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by the second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruit of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us, we pray, in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take me, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it all of you. This cup is the New Testament through my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us go forth in the peace and joy of our Lord as we sing our final hymn for the morning. 